For 13 years, from 1978 to 1991, TV audiences worldwide tuned into the TV drama Dallas, a story about two warring oil families in Texas, the Ewings and the Barneses. For many TV fans unfamiliar with our city, the TV show Dallas represented a simplistic view of what people imagine Texas oil families to be like. Even today, the stereotype that a family living in Dallas lives like a member of the Ewing or Barnes family is not reality. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, J.R. Ewing, Major Nelson, Larry Hagman. aspects of this business you never get used to. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me here. I'm, I'm very happy to be back in Dallas. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm really happy to be anywhere. Uh, as you all know, I had a liver transplant six years ago. They put a 35-year-old liver in a 70-year-old man and it makes me about 52. <laughs> so uh, I've always had a warm welcome here. Um, when I first came down to shoot Dallas, uh, it was not quite so warm. Uh, nobody likes their, um, their hometown held up for ridicule or whatever. I remember going to the Dallas Country Club and watching a little Sunday football. And when it was over, I got up and thanked the little guys. And I said, thank you for having me here, boys, and I'll see you around. And as I was walking to the door, one of them said, and thank you for coming, boy. <clears throat> Cold shiver ran up my back. But after 13 years, of, of really warm welcomes, and I mean warm. I, I, we work down here only in July and August through somebody's wisdom in Hollywood. They didn't know. They didn't. It was just a bunch of actors frying out there. But you've always been so warm to us, and, and I think we helped uh, take off the onus of the assassination capital of the world. You know, when we came down here, that's all Dallas was known for. But now if you go abroad and say you're from Dallas, they say, oh, you know JR. You can get a free drink just about any place in the world. So I want to thank Brian's House for having me here. It's, it's a wonderful cause and uh, a very necessary one. And I, I'm, I'm really grateful and honored to be here. And I want to thank uh, Caroline Hunt for having me at the Crescent and at the Mansion for all those years, sitting right over there. She's a good friend and has put up with my nonsense for 13 summers. Uh, thank you, honey. Thank you. Now, you want to have a question and answer period? All right, let's do it. Howdy. Oh, turn that down or turn me down, one or the other. They have prepared a list of questions here, uh, but I have one that I'd like to start with, Larry. Are you about sick of that theme song? <laughs> I never get sick of that theme song. I love it. It's my intro everywhere I go. I would think that, you know, as an actor, this is like actor studio, you'll have to forgive me a little bit. As an actor, you wrestle with the idea of being defined by a role, and only that role, as opposed to the other things that you've done. But you don't seem to have a problem with old JR. Well, I was lucky enough to have I Dream of Jenny. How many people saw I Dream of Jenny out there? Raise your hand. Well, I'll be, everybody, right? I get them from the cradle to the grave. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that that way. Uh, but, and, and Dallas, well, Dallas, you know, I'm proud of that. I've, I've been lucky to have two great roles and two totally different roles. Yeah, I, I remember, and I mentioned I Dream of Jeannie a few minutes ago, but I remember thinking, this man is a natural comic. He's a natural comedic actor. He's got the timing and everything. And then in the next big series, pure evil with a kind of a glint in your eye, is it the same thing, two sides of the same coin? Well, I always considered Dallas as kind of a cartoon anyhow, you know. It was funny as far as I was concerned. And uh, I think if you examine it and look at it over the years, you'll find it amusing too. There seemed to be real chemistry between you and the, the cast, the rest of the cast, and I dream of Jeannie. Was that the case? I mean, it seemed like you enjoyed each other. Oh, yeah. We had a, well, comedy's not funny. Uh, comedy's hard work. And often, uh, it, it, I, it, the only thing I ever had was with the writers. And, and uh, it was Sidney Sheldon at the time. And he had won Academy Award. And 
and he's written about, I think he's got 200 million books out there. So, so you can't really argue with a guy who's the most successful author in the world. Uh, but we've, uh, we've settled our differences and the show went on. The only, the only thing that happened to the show that killed it was we got married and it ruined that sexual tension that we had going. Everybody was wondering, and then once the, an the question was answered, it was no fun in it. Yeah, anymore. well, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you shared a story, and I was listening to uh, you on a talk show this morning. It's in the book, if I'm not mistaken, about a, a moment when you would freeze a scene in order for Jeannie to disappear or something. Uh -huh. you, they would stop the tape, and you would have to hold your breath. Yeah. And then they'd roll the film again, and you'd pick up where you left yeah, off. Yeah, well, that was the technique. Uh, you'd say, you'd be having a conversation, and somebody would say, freeze, and you'd hold that until they either pop me into another costume or Jeannie turned into an alligator or whatever. Well, this particular one, um, they popped a, an elephant in between us. She was on one side and I was on the other. And they tried to back it in into the, into the scene. And you were on the wrong end. Uh, well, yeah. They, 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 and, and just as they said, one, two, three, action, it broke wind. And uh, <clears throat> I've never seen an aperture quite that big before, but, uh, and it was a misty wind. Anyhow, we had to, uh, <laughs> We had to close down the show after that. It took too long. To, we, we resumed shooting the next day. Yeah. <laughs> for, for anyone who thinks acting is a glamorous profession, that's enough. To yeah, be. never work with animals or genies. <laughs> <laughs> was, was the chemistry on the cast or the set of Dallas the same? It seemed like everybody enjoyed Oh, yeah, it. yeah. It was a big family. You know, we had 13 years of really wonderful relationships. And, and I've kept a lot of relationships with, uh, with Pat Duffy. We go hunting and fishing a lot down here in Texas, down at Corpus Christi, as a matter of fact. And uh, with uh, Linda Gray, who's uh, remained a great friend of my wife and myself. My wife calls her wife. <laughs> they call each other wife. And, and, and I just saw her in The Graduate in London just last week. And she has a nude scene in there. And I saw more than I've ever seen her in 25 years. <laughs> and revelation, she's in great shape. In the book, you talk about Barbara Bell Geddes and the fact that once you learned that she was on board to play Miss Ellie, uh -huh. you decided that show is for me. Well, uh, she's a class act, you know. And uh, when I heard she's going to be on the show, I said, boy, if she's on, I'm on too. Well, I was going to be on anyhow because I was broke and I'd do anything at the time, but uh, <laughs> it did help me uh, uh, say yes. Uh, were there ever any, I mean, obviously between the director, the producer, the writers, there's always a little creative friction there, but between cast members. Did, no, were, no, uh, no. Somebody said, um, asked me that question today, and I can't remember one instance we had any trouble with, the, with each other. I always made it a point that if anybody, there was any friction going on, I'd go right to the source, source and, you know, talk to them and see what we could all do to make it work, because that's the, the way you keep harmony on the set, you get it out in the open. And once again, if you have those questions, make sure you get them to the volunteers, and we'll get to those in just a second, because I can think of 30 or 40, and we could, I don't want to take up all the time with my questions. When you, obviously, from Weatherford, and you know Texas, you knew Texas, played football, hunted, did all of that cowboy here and everything else. Um, and you brought a lot of things you'd seen in other Texans to bear in the character of J.R. Ewing. Talk about that and talk about the experiences, as you mentioned the Dallas Country Club a few minutes ago, of actually shooting here and parties you had at Wellington's or Elon or wherever you got together and met people and what happened while we were shooting those first few seasons. Oh, well, uh, let me tell you how I got the character first. Uh, my dad was on a retainer to a guy named Jess Hall in Weatherford, Texas, and he had invented a centralizer and a scratcher which cleans out the inside of a, of a pipe, of a pipe stand going down and bringing oil out of the ground. And uh, when I, my mother had, had, had come to me in, in Vermont and where I was going to school and asked me if I wanted to go on the road with her and Annie get your gun. And uh, <clears throat> she had rented a horse and carriage, and we were going around this very picturesque little town of Woodstock, New York, of, of Vermont. And, uh, and she stopped and she said, would you like to go on the road with me? And I, I couldn't think of anything to say. And so I was looking at this horse's ass, and I said, no, I want to be a cowboy. So I left there and came down to live with my daddy. And he was on retainer with Jess Hall, junior, or senior. And uh, when he died, there was a power struggle among the family, and Jess Hall, junior, won. And so that's, that's who I model my character after. And uh, he's probably finding out about that right now. <laughs> so I expect a lawsuit any minute, I suppose. And you probably want a piece of my action. That's <laughs> a little bit of those residuals. Yeah. But, uh, and, and the experiences 
arriving in Dallas, setting up, shooting those first few years? Well, the first few years, uh, the first couple of years was a little dicey with the folks who lived down here. But finally, uh, when JR got shot, I think all was resolved because it was such an uh, international success. And, uh, and then things were smooth sailing after that. And you literally cannot go anywhere in the world without someone saying, JR, JR, JR. Yeah. Everyone knows you. You're a cultural icon. It's wonderful. I love it. Yeah. It is fun. And I didn't know this until today. And again, I heard this on one of the shows that you were visiting, that everybody on the show shot you. Oh, yeah. Well, we didn't want anybody to know. So we, sh we shot everything up until the last scene where it was revealed that I shot. And Mama shot me, and Daddy shot me, and, and Patrick shot me, and Sue Ellen shot me. And I mean, just, and the, the assistant stage manager and the guy who cleaned up around the, he shot me. And, <laughs> so nobody knew who was going to do it. And I was offered uh, $250,000 if I would reveal who did it to a conglomerate of, of uh, newspapers in London and The Hague and South Africa. And I would go there and tell the person, and then that, that uh, reporter would be sequestered until finally down in South Africa. And, you know, I was thinking of doing it. I didn't know who, who did it, see, at that time. But I was thinking of doing it because that was the thing J.R. would do anyhow, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't. I, was, I had morals. Than, I don't know more. There is more, much more to this book than just the, the Hollywood side of your life. There's also a great deal about you're very open and honest about your addictions and your health problems. Um, let's start with the thing I alluded to earlier. You used to, and I think you still do sometimes, carry around a little fan and just... I you didn't bring it to death. Well, back. you know, you, nobody smokes here. I, I was in England. Everybody smokes there, and I use it quite often. But here, everybody stopped because I helped stop them. You did? Yeah. You, you cleaned up the town? Well, I cleaned up the country. Yeah. And I got, I was instrumental in helping getting uh, smoking off airlines, if anybody flies anymore. Why was that such a passion for you? Well, you know, it kills half a million Americans every year. And it's a voluntary death, and it's, it's not including not including the, the the quality of life it affects. Mm -hmm. And it's you know if it came out now it'd be illegal like everything else that's any fun. Uh, <laughs> you also talk about your addiction to alcohol. The yeah. Fact that you had a problem with that. Well, I didn't have a problem. My liver had a problem. <laughs> um, I drank steadily during Dallas and before. I started drinking when I was 14, like most people, and smoking tobacco. And um, I had just kind of got more and more and more until I was finally, during the latter years of Dallas, drinking about five bottles of champagne a day. And I never got loaded. I just kind of got that click. You know, I'd start about 9.30 in the morning, a little orange juice in there to get my vitamins, and, and just kind of, and then about noon, I'd quit the orange juice and just stick to playing. And I just kind of leveled out and just had a good time, never missed my lines or anything like that. But uh, it was destroying my liver, which it finally did. And, uh, <laughs> that made me give up a little too late. What happens when someone walks in and says, Mr. Hagman, you need a new liver? It gives you pause for thought, uh, to say the least. But at that time, I, uh, I developed encephalopathy, which is when you have a bad liver, things aren't working. You have so much toxins in your body that your brain's not working too good. So I said, well, look, I've had 64 really good years. And so let's call it quits. And my wife said, no, no way. No, no way. And so <laughs> I got my liver. <clears throat> I, didn't have to, I didn't have to wait too long. When, once I got on the beeper, they give you a little beeper and you walk around. And when that beeps, you're supposed to call the hospital. Well, it went off twice and they'd called the wrong number. Can you believe that? Oh, my heaven. Yeah, that gives you a little thump, thump. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> And finally, the third one came, and I called the hospital, and the doctor said, well, I got good news and I got bad news. And I said, well, give me the bad news first. He says, well, we're not going to be able to go on the fishing trip that uh, your wife and I had planned for you this weekend up in Alaska because we got a liver, and that's the good news. Uh, we've dispatched a helicopter to come pick you up. And I got on the helicopter and went down to the hospital and um, had the biggest enema I ever had in my life. And um, they uh, wheeled me into the operating room playing the, the theme from Top Gun. No, no, Dallas, that's what they were doing. <laughs> yeah. And when, I, when they showed me up and taken me out, that was Top Gun. Okay. <laughs> Which might explain what you did next, because if, if, if I had just conquered um, smoking on airlines, and if I had just had a liver transplant, I don't think that I would go riding on a motorcycle 
And I don't think that I would do a Gary Busey impersonation and lay the thing down. And oh, wait a minute. I had my helmet on. Well, I know, but, you know, that's... Well, I don't know. You know, you, I've been riding for 40 years, and uh, I courted my on a Vespa in London, and so she's been riding on the back of it for 40 years, and finally graduated to Harley-Davidson, and uh, I just made a mistake. I was going down the hill. I just got out of my, uh, my gate at my house up in Ohio. and... I was going down the hill and the car came around a little fast and I hit the front brake, which I never do, and it just went like that, pow, wow, and I broke three ribs. And that was when I was doing uh, primary colors. Mm -hmm. So uh, about five days later, I reported for work and they had a 3,000 people in a, in, a, in a scene there where they're, I, I'm running for president, I'm declaring my, my, my run for presidency. And I walked up to Mike Nichols and he saw me coming with my arm in a sling. He says, uh, <clears throat> Are you going to wear that? I said, no, I can take it out, but I can't move it. He said, well, I got you at the podium. He said, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'll just lift it up on the podium and put it like that. So, so I went out there and did my thing. It worked pretty well. And um, what, what was I talking about? I digress so much, I forget what the hell broken I'm talking ribs. about. Broken ribs. Oh, broken ribs. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, but that goes with, uh, that goes with uh, growing old. Uh, you just don't want to give up those things, you know? I've recently taken up parapowering, which is uh, you strap a motor with a propeller on your back and you have this elliptical parachute and you can run a few feet and you take off and you can fly all over the place. That's, that's really good. Uh, that's fun. How long have you all been married? 47 years. How have you done this? <laughs> 47 years? Yeah. How? <laughs> I, I've never seen you two together, but you're not beaming. You absolutely glow when you're with each other. Oh, yeah. Right? Well, What's the secret? She plugged me in. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, here we go again. Ah. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Texas girls. Oh, no. Oh, uh, <laughs> this, uh, this note says, ask uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand so the volunteers can spot you. But we have quite a few here, and we'll try to get to many, as many of them as we can. Before we do, very quickly, uh, Primary Colors, wonderful movie, and a wonderful little role, and, and a lot of fun. My favorite, if I had a choice of 10 films to take with me to the island, one would be Failsafe, and that was your first movie. First movie, yeah. And you played across from Henry Fonda, who was, the pre I don't know if you've seen the film, but it's the doomsday Cold War scenario, and Henry Fonda's the president, and Larry is the translator, in the war room beneath the White House, and you have to play a role in which you're required to sit on the phone, listen to the Russian premier, Soviet premier, and translate into English, but it's the most remarkable performance in a remarkable movie. Where did that come from? It was your first movie. Yeah. How'd you do that? How'd that do what? That Failsafe's a darn good movie. What'd you think? Oh, uh, I liked it. <laughs> oh, uh, the Russian, well, I was listening to the guy in, in Russian, but uh, it wasn't a guy, it was another guy out there speaking English. And then I pretended that I was interpreting. And as a matter of fact, I went out to California, I was broken, I was looking for a job out there, and, and somebody had seen the film and said, you speak Russian, don't you? I got a great part as a Russian interpreter. I said, yep, <laughs> absolutely. So he gave me the part and I hired a guy to teach me Russian overnight. And uh, it was only a few lines, but it paid you know enough to send back to my and feed the kids and all. If you, have a, if you have a chance to rent that movie, rent it. It's unbelievable. And my last question, and we'll get to these. How did 40-something years, that's just, in Hollywood, it's remarkable. Remarkable. It's a remarkable thing anyway. And it's a wonderful relationship. Oh. Beyond being plugged in, what's the secret to your success? Oh, my wife says two bathrooms. <laughs> Think about it. In the morning, Rushing around two bathrooms is an absolute necessity. You, it's in the book. Your questions. A two-parter. Number one, how did you feel when Dallas was canceled? And number two, what members of the cast do you still keep up with? Um, well, I felt okay. Thirteen years is a long time for any series, but I would have done it 25 years. It was a license to steal, really. I, I only worked about a half a day, three days a week. Uh, at the end there. So, uh, you know, they would build a scene around what my reaction is to what was going on. And, and they'd, they'd say, oh, uh, uh, JR's going to come on, he's going to be angry. And he's, oh, and I come on with my smile on my face, you know, and scare the hell out of everybody. Yeah. 
It was it was fun, uh, and when it ended, well, it ended. That's all. That's and you keep up with some. Of your I friends? keep up with uh, Patrick Duffy. Like I said, we go hunting, fishing a lot, and uh, and Linda Gray and, and my wife and I we have dinner probably twice a month. And uh, Mary Crosby is a very good friend. She's a little girl who shot me. Yeah. And we we're real good friends. I gave her away in her marriage, and, uh, godfather to a child. Oh, neat. Um, Nancy Heyman wants to know when you're going to ask her back to heaven. <laughs> Anytime, Nancy. <laughs> Anytime. She she drove down from from San Francisco to for my 70th birthday just a couple of weeks or couple, three weeks ago, and because uh, she doesn't like flying. And that time they weren't letting air, airplanes in the air. Yeah. Now, so. Um, here's a question. Which character, J.R. or Major Nelson, most closely resembles your personality? Positive and negatives of both characters beyond J.R. Good guy, Major Nelson, bad guy, all of that. But which one's more closely like you? Yes. <laughs> both of them. That's, uh, Faye Dunaway has a line in Three Days of the Condor that says, these are the pictures I take. They're not me, but they must be me because I took them. <laughs> so, JR, there is a little JR, there is a little. I guess there is, yeah. Yeah? yeah. Does, he, does he ever come up around the house or? Uh, it not allowed. Not allowed. <laughs> 40 plus years. Uh, describe your favorite episode of Dallas. That's not easy. Oh, I think it was when I was, when I was putting Sue Ellen in the insane asylum. That was it. <laughs> and she deserved it, too, you know? <laughs> she, she was playing around with old Cliff Barnes. I love Cliff I remember the episode where Brian Dennehy and a bunch of crooks had taken everybody hostage at South Fork, and yeah. you and the rest of the Ewing boys got the guns and went after them. Yeah. It was a real posse ride. Yeah. Uh, who came up with that stuff? I don't know. It's supposed to be a hurricane in Dallas, too. Well, these are all writers from California. They didn't know hell about Texas, you know. But that's the one, that's the one show that really changed the director and the producer, because we had a scene where Brian Dunn, he has us all, he's, he's holding us hostage in our living room. And uh, uh, my little niece goes in a huff. She says, well, I'm going to go upstairs and go to bed. And as she was crossing, I had my drink in my hand, and I'm looking at her like, like, like that. And the director stops, and he says, cut. He says, Larry, you can't look at her like that. She's your niece. <laughs> and I said, Al, this is Texas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's just a joke, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not in Arkansas, it's not. <laughs> um. Sorry, Gene, I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot y'all were here. Uh, and I genuinely mean that. Uh, Larry, would you relate, I did forget, would you relate the story in the book about your mother's reply when you asked how it felt to be the son of an icon? Oh, yeah, well, we were having a party. It was about the second or third year of the show, and we had this big house in Malibu, and CBS gave a party out there and invited all the TV editors from all over the country. And one young girl rushed up to my mother and said, oh, Miss Martin, what's it like to have a son as an icon? And my mother looked at her and she says, my dear, my son is a star. Ah, an icon. <laughs> she was dead right, too. Talk about your mom for a minute. I mean, what she meant to you. Uh, and beyond the stage, what kind of mom she was? Well, I didn't know her real well until I was about 12. My grandmother had and raised me, and mother went out to, to get her fortune in, in Hollywood, and then finally ended up getting it on Broadway. But there were some years there, until I was 12, I really didn't have much contact with her. And then she married a man I was not enamored with, and he was not enamored with me, that's for sure. And so we didn't get along too well. So when my grandmother died, I went back uh, to live with them for a year in, in New York, and went to Trinity School there, one of those high flute and boys schools. And, uh, we, it didn't work out. I, I, uh, mother would, would sleep until 11, I'd get up at 7 o'clock, go to school, and then I'd come home at 5 and she would, we'd have a dinner, and that was about the only contact. And on weekends she rested, she had a matinee and evening on Saturday, so we really didn't have a lot of contact. And I had a stepfather who wanted to keep us apart anyway. He was a control freak. And uh, so it, it, we didn't really have a relationship until Richard died. And, uh, and, and then we, we started to kick in. We started living near each other and saw each other quite a bit. And, and uh, we, we, I fell in love with her and she with me. And uh, it was nice. And by this time, she had had grandchildren and so forth. So it was easier. It was a more buffer. 
And uh, it was great. As a matter of fact, when she died, when she died, it was on a, a Sunday the last time I saw her, and I wasn't speaking. I wasn't talking that day. And um, she used to not like Bach very much. She dis found it distasteful. But I used to whistle. She taught me how to whistle. And she was a really great whistler. And so when I came in the door, she started whistling a Bach convention. And I started on the counterpoint, and we did about 10 minutes of Bach whistling. Away. And I kissed her goodbye, and that's the last time I ever saw her. And she died shortly after that. And uh, it just kind of uh, shows how, you know, how nice a relationship we had. Hmm. Who did you beat out in the casting for J.R. Ewing? I don't know. I don't think there was anybody even considered as a secondary role. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't think anybody was, was thought about. Do you know anybody? I have no idea. Oh, okay. <laughs> Honest to goodness, I can't think of anybody else who could play it. Uh, I think you're right. Tell, <laughs> tell us about your relationship, well, with your mom. We already got to that one. I don't know who it was, but uh, what? Why was Jeannie not allowed to show her navel? Oh, yeah. Um, well, at that time, um, the lady who was running the uh, standards and morals of NBC was a retired nun. And so she didn't think a, na a navel ought to be shown. And uh, it was a big controversy over it because it got us a lot of publicity, too, you know. Boy, if the navel didn't kill her, J.R. must have. Um, <laughs> your hobbies, you mentioned hunting and fishing and that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, what else do you like? What else do you like? Oh, I have a Harley. I do a lot of Harley riding. With Still. My, uh, with the Uglies. The yeah. Ugly. Mm -hmm. That's my motorcycle group. Uh, Peter Fonda found the guy. It's a bunch of guys called the Uglies, and we just, we don't have any rules, and we just ride, that's all. And most of them have like one leg and one tooth, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I think Peter and I are the only one with our own teeth. And uh, Senator Knight, Ben Knight Horse Campbell, he's in it. And uh, Dallas uh, Taylor, who was a drummer for Crosby, Stills and Nash. And David Crosby is in it. He's got some celebrities, but most of them are just pretty ugly. Is there anything you haven't, <laughs> is there anything you haven't done, a role you haven't played, you'd really like to play? Oh, uh, Santa Claus. I'd like to play Santa Claus. Really? Yeah, if I grow a beard, I have a nice white beard now. So that'd be kind of fun. A lascivious Santa Claus. Oh, gee. <laughs> Lucy, come sit on my lap. Um, He's not going to let that go, is he? No. I, uh, I think, are there any more questions? Do we have any? Where are our volunteers? No more? Okay, we're about out of time anyway, and we know that you've got, you've got a book signing tonight. Yeah. At Borders? Preston, Borders? Borders? Is it Borders? I've got it written down here. Preston, yeah, read it, because I forgot. Uh, <laughs> what country are we in? What city are we in? Yeah. How many cities have you hit on this? Oh, oh, well, I was in Dublin and Belfast last week, and London, and uh, New York, and now I'm here, where, that was, this is Dallas, and Atlanta, and then, um, and then L.A. And I'm told that they are ordering reprints and extra editions in Europe. And, yeah, in and England. people are snapping this up and they can't get enough of it. And yeah, obviously, well, we sold a thousand here. Thank you very yeah, much. I, yeah, I really okay. appreciate that. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> by the way, if uh, I, I need to ask uh, that, or I need to say at least that if you'd like to contribute twenty-five dollars, there's an envelope on the table, and you're more than welcome to take the centerpiece home with you. Uh, that would be a gift in exchange for your contribution to Brian's house. It is Borders Books tonight, right? Which one are we talking about? Preston Royal? Okay, I, same here. I've been enamored of the answers and reading the book, and I haven't paid much attention to where you're going to be, and I can't imagine what your schedule must have been like the last two weeks. But Larry, it's a real pleasure. You've made Dallas look very good to an awful lot of people. Borders Books, Preston Royal tonight at what time? Seven? 6.30? 6.30? Okay. Your ghostwriter? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Larry Hagman, Thank ladies you. and gentlemen. Let me get my hat here. In Fort Worth, we have a saying that sometimes a hat just sits good on a man. It does on Larry Hagman. This is the real world, and so is Brian's house. The difference is, by what you do here today, you make Brian's house world a whole lot brighter. Thank you all for coming. Hope you have a great afternoon. Goodbye.